JP, we we're actually able to get Walter up here. If yeah, we, let's, uh, let's change the subject real, real quick. I, I wanted to um, get Walter to um, participate in the discussion. First of all, if you guys haven't read Walter's um, Walter Isaacson's uh, um, auto, or biography on Steve Jobs, it's one of the best biographies biographies i've ever read it's awesome. actually all his stuff is phenomenally good i recommend all of his books I agreed but you know uh, for our industry in particular the steve jobs one provides so much insight i, I loved it walter so i'd love to get you in this discussion i know you've been sort of uh writing the elon musk uh, biography so if you could sort of add to that discussion and your um your time spent with Elon, that would be great. Sure. Uh, it's been epic being able to spend time with Musk. And uh, as uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed is that I've hung around a lot of these Twitter spaces. So many people are uh, on it, like uh, Sawyer and the Whole Earth Catalog and Evan and Ross are people I follow quite a bit. And so they've informed it. Uh, and it's particularly interesting because of things you've said that uh, – people don't fully realize. I know you've talked about Tesla a lot, but Neuralink, for example, is uh, going to be epic. Likewise, I, I think real world AI in which you combine Tesla, full self-drive, and Optimus the robot by processing, hopefully using Dojo, uh, processing video feeds, is gonna be bigger than large language model generative. Uh, AI. So all of these things are part of the book. The book comes out September 12th. It just went up on Amazon. And I'd be happy to answer any questions people have about what it's like spending so much time with Elon and getting inside his head, for better and for worse, because he goes through his uh, dark periods, too, as you all well know. He's quite mercurial. Yeah, I, I I have What's... a question, Walter. Did you stay up all night with him during all these sessions and, and such? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, and especially at Starbase, you know, where we were in the Airstream trailers uh, and in Austin and throughout the night. You know, he has meetings at 9, 10, 11 midnight, and he's allowed me to be in all of his meetings either virtually or just by his side for the past two years. Because I'm super curious about his work ethic and like his ability to accomplish so much because I run like one company and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so I just like I don't know how he does this. Uh, well, he read the book. Take it weekends. takes me 600 pages to explain. <laughs> but I tell you, it is epic the way he does that. He, um, you know, he's not super superhuman. He's just plain superhuman. He does sleep late. He does run late at meetings at times. Uh but I guess one of the most amazing things he does is he can sequentially focus. I remember the night that he actually ended up getting Twitter. Uh, in other words, the board agreed he was going to get Twitter. The deal was accepted. And he went to uh, Brownsville in order to do a Raptor engine redesign meeting late at night and then stayed up with Kimball at a honky tonk on the road from Brownsville to Boca Chica and then focused on uh, the battery production issues, some of them, uh, and which whether they should all be moved to Austin and the Monterey plant, whether the next generation Tesla should be built in Mexico. It was all in one night. And one of the difficulties of writing a book is you don't want to hop around and say, okay, we're going to switch from paragraph to paragraph, from Tesla to Twitter to SpaceX. But that's what his mind does. He drills down deep and then switches focus. Walter, can I ask you a well, question? Sure. Uh, what would you say um, the two biggest similarities, the two biggest different, differentiations are between Jobs and Musk? And what would you say their biggest like strengths and, and maybe weaknesses are? Um, as leaders and, and or as people? Well, their biggest similarities are they're deeply obsessive and passionate and in some ways not very empathetic. Both Steve Jobs said to me uh, when I said, you know, why are you so uh, mean to people at times? Why are you so tough on them? Because Waz had said, that's a question you got to ask in the book, is did he have to be so tough? Did he have to be so intense and hardcore? Did he have to be so cruel to people at times? And he and Jobs said to me, look, 
uh, for a person like yourself, it's kind of egotistical. You get to be kind to people, sweet to people, and you hope that they like you. But I'm running a big enterprise, and if I try to be kind to the person right in front of me, uh, it means there may be a thousand people in the enterprise who are going to get hurt because I'm just trying to please and be liked by the person in front of me. And so when I asked Elon Musk this, he said the exact same thing. He said, yeah, you know, empathy is a nice uh, trait to have, but it doesn't work well in Polytopia. It doesn't work well in video games, and it doesn't work well with running a company. Sometimes you got to be tough. One of the, <laughs> you talk about the biggest difference. Steve Jobs spent every day, I'd walk with him through Johnny Ives, you know, secure design studio in that ground floor room in Cupertino. And he would fondle the design of everything, make sure the chamfers on the iPhone were curved the way he wanted. But then he'd just throw it over the wall for somebody else in China to manufacture. The brilliance of Elon Musk is he knows you cannot outsource the manufacturing. That in order to have an end-to-end -end control of the product, you've got to build the factories. And if you build the factories and you put the designer's desk right next to the assembly lines, you will be able to innovate every hour as you see how the manufacturing works. And one of the bad things about America in the past uh, 30 years has been that we've outsourced manufacturing so we don't have a fingertip feel for the innovation the way Elon Musk does. It's fascinating that he also runs SpaceX in the same way, meaning like he has sort of uh, has designed SpaceX to be a mass manufacturing of uh, Raptor engines and even the rockets themselves. He's, he's like created a manufacturing facility. Can, can you talk a little bit about the SpaceX aspects of, of it and why that's so important to the success of space exploration? Absolutely. I mean, when you go down to Boca Chica and walk those assembly tents and you look at the Raptor engines uh, and the uh, domes and everything being built, his design is not just to make a great Raptor engine, but a Raptor engine that you can build one per day and churn out at scale. And he says, we're going to need a thousand starships, which would be, you know, 40,000 Raptor engines. Uh, in order to get us to Mars someday. So he's not just focusing on building the product. As he said, building the product is hard, but the machine that builds the machine is harder. So every decision he makes, like switching from Inconel to stainless steel and part of the Starship, is because we need to mass manufacture it. And he will be there at 3 in the morning, walking through Boca Chica, looking at every step of the assembly line and where the holdup is. And sometimes he'll be brutal in telling them you got to fix these things. Um, but that's, that's how he's going to get to Mars. Who is he taking inspiration from, right? So Steve Jobs was like famously into architecture and design and, but also into technology, right? What Elon's doing is kind of breaking the mold uh, kind of across different industries right you mentioned Neuralink, spacex tesla etc like does he look up to jobs like who else is is his like inspiration for the endeavors that he's going through you know he uh, jobs had a whole lot of heroes and we went through them in the book quite a bit elon is not driven by figuring out heroes he does think that henry ford was brilliant because he could both make a good car and then make a good factory to make the car. And of course, one of Henry Ford's great innovations was not the Model T, but the assembly line to build the Model T. So uh, Elon has talked about that quite a bit. Hey, Walter, a huge fan. Now I got to ask, when Elon decided to buy Twitter and all this drama went down with the lawsuit, were you just thinking, Man, this is going to be great content for my book. No, I hate to tell you this, and I know this is a public forum, so I probably shouldn't say it. I, I took on this book because I love the notion of electric vehicles. I love the notion of battery storage. My dad was an electrical engineer. I worked at it. So, uh, I also love space travel. And I thought at the end of 2022, I'd been working with them for more than a year or so. 
I'm thinking, all right, he's sent off now more rockets than anybody in America has ever done. He's moved us totally into the era of electric vehicles and sold almost a million Teslas. And then he's saying, I guess I ought to reduce the amount of drama in my life, he says to me at the beginning of 2023. And then he says, but I can't. And he was secretly buying up shares of Tesla that February uh, of this year. And when I start of, twi- of Twitter, Twitter. And, uh, and I uh, I thought this is not well suited for him. He has an absolute feel for manufacturing, for physics, you know, for everything. But he doesn't have a feel for human emotions. He doesn't have a feel for the dynamics of and he's got incredibly strong opinions, which makes him a somebody who's good at tweeting. But it doesn't make you good at running Twitter. If you're trying to make it a level playing field. So for a while, like a lot of people around him, his brother, his close friends, we're sitting there and it was actually in Austin, Texas. Gigafactory was just up and running. We're on that second floor mezzanine. And he's trying to talk about why he's doing it. Should he do it? And he was offered a board seat, as you know, in April of uh, this year. I mean, of last year. And he agreed to take it, which would have stopped his ownership at 9.9%, I think. But I went off to Hawaii one weekend. It's a long chapter in my book, very vivid with Larry Ellison stuff and the people he's with, and just decided, no, I want total control of Twitter, and decides to reject the board seat, then goes up to Vancouver with Claire uh, Boucher and um, asks to see Claire's parents. And stays up all night playing Elden Ring. And at the end of the night, he says, I made an offer. So it was very, it was a weird, wild ride. And I guess my first reaction would be, should have been, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world for the book. The person who was the most fascinating person on the planet just went up one order of magnitude. But frankly, I was a little, had a trepidation at the time. But, you know, I'm just a biographer. I don't get to decide what the story is. You mentioned Larry wow. Ellison. Does he ask anyone? That's for awesome. You, yeah, you this is going to be an amazing book. I can't wait to it get it. It will be I'm epic. Right and it's not because I, I, I got to order this book. Yeah, it's on Amazon. They got it discounted because the more people order it, the more they discount it. So they give you the lowest price you can. Really, really quickly, I own that. It just click into Walter's bio and it is the link in his bio. It's the pinned tweet and you can see all that and find the book. We've been talking about Elon Musk and Tesla for the last two hours or so. And you can go in and read about it from someone who's been on the inside. So that's really exciting coming out September 12th. Check out the link in his bio and we appreciate you uh, impromptu joining. Hey, Evan, joining thank you. There. And thank you for the shout out for the book by if any of y'all ever want me back, because I, I hover in the background. I think Siobhan saw me on this yeah. meeting, and then y'all spotted me. But, heck, I'm, um, as I said, I like better than listening to or talking about Elon. So you can DM me or email me, and uh, I'd be happy to do any spaces with people. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. This is so awesome, Walter. Your insights are amazing, and your, the fact that you followed uh, Steve Jobs and now Elon – must give you such insight into the type of innovators um, that have really changed the world. What would you say really between the two men stand out as the biggest similarities and differences? Well, the biggest difference, as I said, is that Musk cares about manufacturing and he realizes true innovation only comes when you have a, your hand on the stove, as he puts it, meaning his desk is next to, as you know, uh, in Austin is, He's right next to the assembly line, and in uh, Hawthorne he is. And he's always walking the assembly lines. I think they, the similarity is this unbelievable reality distortion field type of passion. And that can be a bad side as well as a good side. I mean, Elon Musk's reality distortion field, uh, you all are very familiar with. I mean, I think I started in 2015 with him saying FSD will be ready by the end of the year. On the other hand, without such reality distortion fields, you don't shoot up starships, you don't get into orbit, you don't bring us into the era of electric vehicles. Uh, and Steve had the same thing, which is don't be afraid you can do it. And pushing people, he 
push people, both of them push people and drive them nuts, push them till they get very angry and, you know, drive them to distraction. But every single person in my book says he drove me to distraction, but he also drove me to do things that I didn't know I'd be able to do. And one other thing about the book, uh, I've been a journalist for 30, 40 years. Every single quote in the book, every single anecdote, every single opinion is on the record. There is no natu- there's no anonymous quotes in the book, no not for attribution, because I believe you take responsibility for your own words. Walter, how yeah. um, late does, does your um, time with Elon go? Do you spend time with him that's covered in the book this year as well? Oh, yeah. Like, well, uh, like trying to last Twitter? night uh, is, you know, our last conversation on a couple of things. Yeah, we, I definitely go all the way through uh, the Starship launch on April 20th and then the launch of XAI right after that. I was down in Austin uh, with him. Uh, and the book has been turned in, but even as I said, I've spoken to him twice this weekend about, uh, little updated things. He's been awesome, which is he's never asked to read the book, nor has he read the book. He said, just make it honest, but it, it'll end in a round now. Basically we go through Linda Yaccarino being hired. Literally, Dude, this, this, this space the, is the last, the last part of the book. Walter, I have a, a question for you. I've been um, in, in the military and, and one for me there on active duty, or I'm now in the guard for 12 years. And Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much. You know, there's a – oh, well, thank, thank you for saying that. I, um, I wasn't trying to get <laughs> <laughs> appreciation, but I was trying to make context here. So there's a lot of, like – you know, wartime comparisons that people use in business, right? But I, I look at Elon Musk as probably one of the CEOs that that has uh, makes decisions that potentially like impact uh, thousands slash millions of people's lives. And some of the decisions he makes truly are life or death, right? Whether it's um, things around rockets and sending people to space, potentially things around Tesla, autonomous driving, all of that. Uh, and in the military, there's there's certain thresholds and, and ways that they sort of like minimize risk at different levels. And, and that could be checks and balances on decisions and stuff like that. Uh, with Elon, I, I feel like for, for Tesla and really everything he's done, but I almost feel like there's no there's not a lot of like checks and balances sometimes in some of the decisions he makes. And I'm just curious uh, if that if that came came up or if you oh a hundred percent it's one of the themes then, in the book from the very a hundred percent right which is as peter Thiel says in the book uh this is most uh entrepreneurs try to minimize risk some of us try to calculate risk elon tries to embrace risk and that's what makes them different it's why boeing got a contract to send people into orbit the same time spacex did but Boeing hasn't even gotten a test flight up, and there have been 30 or so orbital launches of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Elon's uh, willingness and almost addictiveness towards risk begins as a small kid, partly from his father being a very psychologically damaging part of his life, to growing up in the violence of South Africa. He just learned that America has become far too risk averse, that we have more regulators and referees than we have doers, and that he's going to take risks that others won't take. And that included most recently shooting shooting off Starship when he knew it probably wouldn't make it into orbit, but let's shoot it up. We've got 10 others on the assembly line ready to go next, and let's learn things it's why we don't build high speed rail or do a lot in this country is we have become too risk averse. And that's one of the themes of the book. Hey, Walter, on that note, let me pop in. For Hold on. Sawyer had a question. Can we get a Sawyer's question? Yeah. <laughs> go to Sawyer and then I I'm a huge fan of Sawyer. So I'll listen to his question. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. I appreciate it. And thanks for coming on. Uh, could you talk about Elon's ability to compartmentalize and juggle multiple companies at once? Because, you know, there are some people that think Elon has too much on his plate, but he seems to have an incredible ability to 
not only absorb a lot of information, but solve many problems at once into context switch really well. He context switches, Sawyer, and you said it right. He doesn't exactly multitask. I've used that word and realized it wasn't right because he gets so intensely focused. I've been with him for three hours uh, with Jake McKenzie, who is in charge of the Raptor rocket redesign, where he just is so intensely focused on a particular valve. And then immediately he switches over to some blue check mark crisis at Twitter and focuses on that. And he just doesn't get distracted when he's doing the serial focusing. I, you know, he's running six companies now when you add in uh, XAI, the artificial intelligence company. And I don't think it's a great thing. He has dozens of direct reports in every company. But what he does is he drills down on the engineering and the product, and he lets, you know, Gwen Shotwell at SpaceX, or I hope now Linda at um, Twitter, handle a lot of the other things going on. Siobhan handles uh, Neuralink. And so he'll sweep into a Neuralink and say, all right, that chip is too complex. We can't have this many threads. You have to make it one unified device. And he'll turn out to be right in his engineering instincts, but then he'll switch his focus and be worried more about uh, whether you need shrouds on the booster of, um, uh, you know, uh, the Starship. Any other question there, sir? Walter, you mentioned you don't think it's a no, good no. idea what, for him what, to maybe one second. be he, spread he, so thin. Is there... You mentioned Larry Allison before, who's always been like an advocate and sort of like a, it feels like a quasi mentor from the outside to him. Like when he's dealing with all these things, like, is there anyone that you noticed of your. Wait, uh, I'm kind of losing you all. Is, is he trying to process by himself? I'm, I'm sorry, would you repeat that? I think it broke up a bit. With yeah, I think the sound. You, me- you mentioned bit. Larry yeah, Allison. Yeah, Allison's a mentor. Um, I think JP might be having some problems. I'm going to bring him down, and if he wants to come back up, he can pop back up. But the sound has been troubling. And, and don't worry if this happens to you, everybody, because spaces are apparently being very rough today. But, Sawyer, did you have a follow-up or any other thoughts on that answer? No, that was it. Thank you, Walter, for that. Uh, thank you, That's Sawyer. Perfect. And, and, Walter, I wanted to personally uh, thank you as well for coming up and joining us on the panel. I definitely had heard of your work, and now getting to go through the account is really fun. I actually see people literally posting screenshots of their receipt, having just purchased your book. Hey, in I our love you. Section. I came on this because I'm taking a walk today, actually going to the gym because Elon's not as busy. And uh, I, I always listen to these things. I didn't mean to um, crash your party, but thank you for having me on stage. No, thank you for and I will the party. promise. No, this, this is this is so awesome. This book. It's the most awesome experience of my life, the most epic. I mean, being around Steve Jobs was fine, but Elon gave me 10 times as much access, 20 times, meaning be with him all night, all day, and look at his mind work. And I've never seen a figure as fascinating as him. And it's not like I'm a total fanboy. I mean, I, I think he can be pretty rough, and I think his politics sometimes veers a little bit too close to, uh, I don't know, his father and others' politics. But uh, I hope it's an honest book, and I know it's going to be an epic one. I, I've got another question for you, Walter. You also wrote books on Ben Franklin and Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. Um, how would you compare Elon to those two? Yeah, I like to write about innovation and invention and creativity. Other people like writing about smart people. Smart people are a dime a dozen. You have to think out of the box and be innovative the way Musk is. And Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the reason I did it is Steve Jobs pushed me when Steve Jobs was dying. He said, you got to do Leonardo. And I said, why? And he said, because all of your books are about innovation and innovation occurs when the humanities are connected to technology or the arts are connected to science. If you remember Steve's product launches, they always ended with that street sign showing the intersection of the liberal arts and technology. And so Musk, as you know, 
has a wide range of interests across history, the humanities, technology. And I think that puts him in the category of, well, Leonardo da Vinci may be in a category of his own. He was a person who tried to know everything you could know about everything that was knowable in his time. But I always look for the Leonardo da Vinci who have a broad range of interests. And uh, that certainly fits with Elon. Perfect. Okay. Hey, Stock Market News, you mentioned you had something you wanted to throw into the mix here, right? Oh, maybe not on the back end there. Oh, yeah, Evan? Sorry, yeah. No, I just wanted to give a shout out to all of our amazing speakers up here. Obviously, Walter, go and check out his pinned tweet. A lot of other really great people up here. You can obviously, uh, we're doing the Space with Savvy Trader as well. You can see mine and Wolf's portfolio for free. We love to have the disclosure out there. Uh, I do own a good bit of Tesla of mine if you guys do do want to go and see that as we're asking the questions. But I, 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 Walter, if I could ask a question around Twitter and just over these last couple months, um, it, it's just, I feel like it's just been so crazy. So I, I would first love to know just kind of what the last three, four months of really turning the ship, turning the tanker as succession would say were, were like compared to the uh, years before it. Uh, was there a lot more time spent? Was there more... Uh, wakeless nights was it more stressful i would love to know how it compared to uh, some of the previous crazy times that you the past through. six months of uh twitter have been crazed he hasn't been uh like he was in 2018 where he really spun out of control with you know he was very depressed and very upset he's exhilarated and energized by this but there are scenes in my book in the past few months uh people don't know like when James Musk and Andrew, his cousins, and he decide on Christmas Eve to turn the plane around and to go to the Sacramento Server Center. This may be why we're having a little trouble on spaces. And it's like, all right, they're going to try to charge us for this. We're going to get pliers and things from Home Depot, and we're going to take those servers and put them in trucks, despite the company trying to prevent us, and we're going to move them to the Portland uh, Server Center. And it was like a three-night, all-night craze thing to do, very Elon-like, because he just said, let's do it. Let's not worry about the rest. And it worked. He got all those uh, racks of servers out. But it also, as you know, hurt the reliability of Twitter. Likewise, they went through round and round of layoffs and firings. And it was interesting to watch him all night with his young cousins and a team from Tesla Autopilot Going through the code of every Twitter engineer, I thought, and so did three, I won't name names, although the names are named in the book, but there are people very close to them. We're all sitting there in the hot box room at Twitter headquarters, and we're trying to, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just taking notes, but they're trying to stop him, saying, if you fire 85% of the people, the whole, we will not have Twitter. And Elon is like cackling in laughter, and he gets up every morning, logs on to see if Twitter still exists. Well, he did lay off 85% of the people, 90% of some of the engineers, and yet we have had more improvements and changes and product features in Twitter in the past six months than we did the previous three years, including the fact that we are all now on Spaces and we have longer tweets and I'm going to publish some of my book on Twitter. It's, uh, it's uh, I, I could get into but won't right now my qualms about the political thumb he's putting on the scale, because I think the most important thing for Twitter, and he says this in his calmer moments, is that it's common ground for everybody. You're you're just as respectful to NPR and PBS as you are to uh, Fox or Tucker. Uh, And I think Twitter has to remain a common ground as opposed to the danger to democracy that would come if Liberals and progressives all move to one social network. Conservatives are in another social network. And we don't have dialogue across the spectrum. Well, even more and more people doubling down that they're buying the book, Walter. And Rob, my, my comments are getting spammed here. Uh, with the- I, I, I bought mine. I just bought mine. <laughs> well, Amazon thanks forward. you and I thank you. And I guess Jeff Bezos thanks you, but that's a different answer. Well, we're, we're, we're good. You- we're, Wait one second, one second. We're 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 good for business. Stock at Amazon, don't worry. We're 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 good for business, Walter. Me and you are gonna have to connect. We'll uh we'll keep running 
running the sales up over here. I love to see it. Um, two things real quick for the audience. Um, I know there's a million of you requesting. I see the comments. Spaces only gives me 10 speaker spots, two co's. They are all full. We are doing Tesla Spaces, though, every single week. So if you do like this stuff, you will have opportunities to uh, either listen or, of course, you can always comment your questions. And if we see them and they're good ones, we can take them. And then number two, I also wanted to give a big shout out, like Evan said, awesome speaker at panel up here. I know some of them are, you know, sometimes getting 20 minutes to speak and sometimes two minutes. And they really do a great job with being flexible. So we do appreciate them. And then I also want to give a big thank you to my friends over at Savvy Trader, who were the idea for having this space. And Tamid, who's the CEO of Savvy Trader, who supports us heavily on spaces and allows myself and Stock Market News to create spaces like this and uh, do some really cool stuff. And just a quick note, and then I'll bring it right back to Walter. Me and Stock Market News both have our portfolios shared in the top of the space for anyone who wants to see them. My portfolio hit, uh, my growth portfolio hit an all time high today. Every single stock in it is green currently all time. So I'm pretty proud of that. And Evan does have a bunch of Tesla in his. So if you're a Tesla fan, go check out Stock Market News Portfolio, which is shared in the top of the space. All right, let's take a couple questions here. Warren, it's been a let's while. Let's go to Jeff first. I want to get oh, Jeff's uh, question. Let's go to Jeff first. Yeah, go for it, Jeff. Oh, hey there. Thanks for the opportunity. And, and uh, it's great to have you on here, Walter. This insight's incredible. Um, just one just one statement. I've, I've had a career of like working for some really high-profile CEOs and and put some very large product lines into production, billions of units. And I've never seen a CEO that's like Elon that actually thinks about the scale of his product and how, and how he thinks about volume and scale as he's thinking. And even before he's thinking about design, I think that's just a fundamental, huge difference. My one, I had just one question, which was who does Elon seek out uh, for mentorship or advice? Is it, a group of people? Is it one particular person? Is it something that can be discussed? Yeah, as I said, Larry Ellison is somebody he trusts. Larry's only been on two public boards, Apple and now Te- and then Tesla. And he understands the importance of connecting design to a- engineering. And that's sort of the secret sauce of why Elon can make things that can be built at scale, you know. And certainly the next generation car will be that as well. In terms of people who work with him, one who's not well known but is part of the book uh, is um, Antonio Gracias, who's been on the board forever, as most of you investors know, just rotated off. Valor Capital has known Elon since, you know, they were all friends of David Sachs in the PayPal days. And along with Tim Watkins, who's a partner of Elon, they're experts at manufacturing. And so they, Elon has come up with something that I think people like in the book. Some of you may know it. it's called the idiot index, which is the cost of a component divided by the, you know, uh, in relationship to the cost of the raw materials. And the higher the cost of the component in relation to the raw materials, it's a higher what he calls idiot thing because it means that your manufacturing, your stamping, your uh, however you're doing it is costing a lot of money. And so when he wants to manufacture at scale, he will, and there's some scenes in the book where he just brings in the finance people and one of them, he really just rips a new asshole too because they don't know the idiot index of each part. So these are some of the, uh, along with that algorithm he uses of question every requirement, uh, the five or six step algorithm these are the secrets to manufacturing at scale which is why he's totally different from every other car company or for that matter you know boeing yeah the technical term for that is uh conversion cost but i like the idiot index better walter a quick question for you and it's it's a little bit off topic here but i think it's important to talk about you wrote your and i did wikipedia this right i'm i'm not I'm not stalking you, but you wrote your first book, it looks like in 1992. So you've been at this for over 30 years. And you're also, I think, 72, 73. You just spent 71. You know, yeah, but all right. Set, sorry. Bad at and I think um, I wrote a book spent, in 86, but I won't go back there. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm, you know what? I'm going to edit these Wikipedia pages. Oh, no, right I, I, now. Think, but, I think um, it's probably right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> You just you just spent you know six months or eight months or however long with like one of the highest, uh, probably the the 
the CEOs with the most ridiculous work schedules in the world. Um, so I guess question one is just like, we're all content creators here in, in our own ways, right? So what, what tips do you have for that type of longevity? And then you said you're going to the gym today. What, what is your personal health been like? Like, how have you maintained that with this crazy schedule uh, following Elon? Well, it's now that I'm basically turned in the manuscript, I'm trying to regain it. I swim. I love swimming. I'm from New Orleans and uh, grew up swimming every day. It's both a yoga exercise and a physical exercise because it clears the mind. Uh, and, you know, I think I've seen, I saw Blake Anderson and some of my students at Tulane uh, who are on this um, call right now. They seem to have joined. Uh, being a teacher at Tulane, where every day I'm interacting with people who, as Wordsworth said, are the enthusiasts at the dawn of the AI revolution, uh, that helps keep me young and nimble about what new things are happening. And I guess I also don't make a habit of trying to totally keep up with Elon. If at three in the morning he's going to drink some Red Bull and go out, I sometimes like go back to my uh, Airstream trailer or my place in Austin. Hey, Walter, um, of the six companies that Elon is, and by the way, thank you for all you've done. I read the jobs book and loved it. Um, of the six companies that Elon runs and the myriad things that some of them do, are there uh, two or three things that really stand out to you that you're most excited about for the future? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm excited about Starship. And there are things, I want, I want to answer your question directly. I'll say, what am I most excited about that people don't fully appreciate? You know, that they're, because everybody's excited about the fact that we're moving to the elect, uh, electric vehicle era. I think having recreated the internet in outer space with Starlink allows us to decentralize, move off the grid, allows Ukraine to, you know, have its uh, communications, even though Russia was able to hack every other uh, satellite thing. I think that Neuralink is going to be transformative because all great advances in technology involve a better human machine interface, connecting us more intimately to our machines. Whether that was Steve Jobs and the graphical user interface he got at Xerox Park, or with Siri, uh, or JCR Licklider when he does, you know, video screens for computers, the ultimate in human computer interfaces will be chips in our brain that communicate directly and receive information directly from uh, computers. So I'm enormously excited about the um, advances and the fact that, that the company has just gotten FDA approval to go into human trials. Um, I could go on about Optimus, you know, uh, I think FSD is a big deal, but once you make it into a humanoid robot as well, that's more important than generative um, AI from large language models. Adam, want to jump in here? Yeah, I would love to. Walter, thank you so much. Big fan of your book. I have two of them in front of me right now, including The Innovators, which is one of my favorites. So I'm curious, you've written all these biographies, all these titans of technology and innovation. So how does Elon Musk's approach to entrepreneurship and innovation, how do they compare and contrast with these other figures that you've written about before? Well, Elon Musk is not mercenary. He's not driven by, let me start with a profit and loss statement, the way many people doing startups or entrepreneurial endeavors are. If you were driven in that way, you wouldn't say, let me create a rocket company to go to Mars. I mean, there's no P&L you can do in 2008 that says that makes sense. Uh, likewise, Neuralink, likewise, even electric vehicles. You have to remember General Motors had just gotten out of the EV business when Elon is getting into it. And so he's driven by mission. And those missions are epic and phenomenally huge. Like humanity has to be spacefaring uh, if we're going to keep consciousness alive. Or energy to be sustainable has to be a mix of EVs, solar, and batteries. And 
when I hear him talk about these epic missions, at first I thought it was a type of prattle you do on podcasts or pep talks for your team. But the more I heard him, the more I believe that those were the motivating factors. But the interesting thing he does entrepreneurial is he learns on the way, well, how do I make this a business? For example, he's building rockets uh, in order to eventually send humanity into space. But he says, I get it. I could build communication satellites and take maybe just 5% of the internet business that would be 10 times the budget NASA has, so that will fund my mission to Mars. Uh, likewise, uh, when he did the Roadster, it was eventually we'll do mass market vehicles, and he connected it when he brought to, so, um, so, you know, the Tesla Solar and then Tesla Energy into the fold. So likewise with Neuralink, uh, he wants to connect us to our machines but the interim step that will then pay for it, which he really just figured out about a year ago, is, oh, I get it, people who are paralyzed or people who have neurodegenerative diseases will use those chips to bypass the glitch in their um, spinal cord or the glitch in their system. And so we'll be able to have people be able to use their arms or eyes again. So he starts with the mission and then backs into a way to say, here's the way we can uh, make a uh, profit stream out of it. Walter, you have been covering tech for a few decades, and probably one of the most hated people in tech is Larry Ellison. So I was surprised that uh, he, he was such a good friend of Steve Jobs. And it surprises me again to know that he's such a good friend of Elon Musk. How does Larry Ellison connect himself to like some of the you know like I, mean, I know he's like one of the richest people on the planet but considering how hated he seems to be in the tech community how how is it that he's also one of the mentors to these to some of the greatest tech entrepreneurs of our time you know when you're a writer or a biographer sometimes you have to just say i don't know and i was thinking of all sorts of clever answers to that but i don't quite know what makes him i don't know him well i Obviously, interviewed him quite a bit for the book. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm going to have to uh, whiff on that question. I don't know what makes him. It's not with everybody, but Steve Jobs and Elon Musk are two people who did rely on him. He, he is one of the most hated uh, people in tech, right? I'm, I'm not just making that up. He, he hasn't been liked very much in, in the industry. which is. I haven't really heard that. Walter, uh, that question. Oh, I, I, was, I, I was, really I was, don't know either. I, as I say, I, I mean, Elon is hated by a lot of people too, and Steve Jobs was hated by a lot of people, and Bill Gates was hated by a lot of people. I have not yet made the ranking, which would be fun to do, about the ten most hated people in the past fifty years in tech, uh, and I don't know where Ellison would fall. I haven't really focused on him much. I'm sorry. Ellison has a tremendous background, actually, and we actually just took a position in Oracle recently. Um, Ellison has been one of the toughest, smartest, most innovative tech CEOs for like 30 years. And part of that negativity was one of his lieutenants early on was this guy, Mark Benioff. And I think they had this massive falling out and he started Salesforce, uh, really just to like spite uh, Ellison. And so there's always been this sort of battle between tech titans in Silicon Valley. But Larry Ellison is one of the most competent, like kick ass executives in tech history. Well, if I could uh, jump in and change slightly, I have big chapters on Musk versus Bezos, why they're like, why they're different, and the really strange things you don't know about their relationship. And likewise, I have a chapter on Musk and Bill Gates, and especially the trip he made in March of 2022 down to Austin, Texas, and the shorting of the stock issue, and his son, Rory Gates. So I try to, and I, of course, deal with Steve Jobs in the book. So I don't do Ellison much, but I do have quite a bit on Elon versus Steve Jobs, Elon versus Bezos. Elon versus Bill Gates. 
Could you if give you, us a couple you, of tidbits about those if, little things about the you rule? Weren't gonna buy we the book, if you weren't going to buy the book, now you've got to buy it just for the drama. Like, if you're not interested in... Thank you. You, you, you got you to gotta touch on the Bezos drama. That, that, that sounded super juicy. Oh, well, you know, Pad 39A is the story pad at, at I call it Canaveral, sorry, Kennedy Space Center, um, that... Bezos has wanted his whole life since he watched it launch from there to go uh, to the moon and the battle over that. And then the personal battle, even when Justine, Elon's first wife, wrote a book and the question of how it was going to be reviewed on Amazon. And then Bezos coming down to tour SpaceX and must be mad that he hadn't brought and been invited up to Blue Origin. And then it happens. And the things they disagree on and then the fights they have when Bezos does suborbital flights but tries to compare them to what SpaceX was about to do. And as you may know, and this is in the book, Bezos tries to get a patent and actually does for a while on being able to land a booster stage of a rocket upright on a floating vehicle, something like the one click patent he had it at Amazon. And that drove Musk to total uh, distraction. With Bill Gates, it's, it's, a, it's a darker thing. Musk was mainly upset about the shorting of the stock. But Bill Gates, who I actually went and visited to talk about this, for a while he just hates Elon. Because Elon is like, I think, posting pictures of... Uh, Bill looking pregnant, you know, and saying, if you want to lose your boner, look at this picture of Bill Gates. And yet, in the end, Bill Gates admits in the book that how much he's been wrong about, including the fact batteries doing semis um, and how odd he is by Musk's engineering skills. So there's chapters in the book on all of this. So there's no way to get this book out for summer because that's actually when I have time for reading. <laughs> we, I've just given you the cliff notes to it, so you can now uh, take the fall off. Uh, I am rushing pretty hard. I'm, I've been with Simon Schuster long enough that I know when they tell me it'll take five months to print the book, I say, no, it won't. I'm kind of like Elon in that way. It's like, you can do it in four weeks. So we are going to get it out by the very end of August, so it can be on sale September 12th. And it is already, as y'all have been noticing, available for pre-order on Amazon. So they're beginning to get, and I'll do signed copies for people in this. I mean, find some way that I can sign your copies uh, for people who've been on these podcasts that have been so, I mean, these spaces that have been so helpful for me. Well, there's the Tesla takeover in San Luis Obispo at the end of July that you should definitely come to. I don't know if you've ever been to that. But if you want to see the most incredible group of Tesla fans and supporters, it's at the takeover. <laughs> and all of us are going to be there. And you could do book signings and whatever, and it would be hugely beneficial. I well, I don't think I can do it in July since even I can't get them to get it off the printing presses by then. But I'll be at some of these things. Um, and come visit me in New Orleans. It's a nice town. I love New Orleans. It's my favorite yeah. city, so I'm happy to do that. I'll be down in New Orleans, actually, in end of August. Maybe I'll have to connect for a conference uh, going on there. So would love to. And also, Walter, we'd obviously love to get you back on more of these. I know that your DMs are currently closed. If you'd be able to drop me a DM. All right, is so this Walt? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yes, this is Walt. Um, yeah, I didn't know my DMs are closed. I think it's, it's only for followers and people yeah. I follow. Yeah. I'll just follow you, yep. okay? I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure my life can stand too many DMs, but I'll I'll definitely. Uh, <laughs> you. I'll, uh, I'll just let you. Know if if you and, look uh, around, Wolf, you'll see that your latest follower is me. I just click the button. I appreciate you, Walter. It means a lot to me, and uh, I also see the impact you had on teaching because a lot of your students are in the chat. Oh, really? Uh, I, I saw Blake dropping. Anderson. Who else is here? Okay, I saw one that I thought was really, really good as a comment. This one was from, I don't know who it is. Their username is Free Lunch Trading. <laughs> they said that they took your class in 2017 and they still have the transistor you gave out to everyone. You know, it's so important to understand what's at the heart of technology. And 
I grew up, my dad's an electrical engineer, separating boxes of transistors and resistors and using a soldering iron and making circuits. And so I make sure that every one of my students starts with an understanding of on-off switches, how you do Boolean algebra and how you do logic and on-off switches and what a transistor is so that you can visualize a circuit and the logic circuit that's behind it. Yeah, that's definitely a beautiful message. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to keep running this for a few more minutes. I want to respect your time, though, Walter. Do you have a few more minutes? Oh, yeah, I'll do us? a couple more. I really feel like I've crashed a party and y'all were having a great conversation without me, so I don't want to monopolize your time. And if people ask me to, I'll try to come back on. I was just checking out what was on spaces, so I wasn't planning for this. But, um, yeah, let's do four or five more minutes, but I don't want to mess up cool. your party. Let, let's take one. No, definitely not messing up. And we're very happy to have you on. I do see that uh, Chuck is trying to get up here and I'm trying to get Chuck Cook up here because I think that he would be a great speaker to have on stage here. And I do believe that he mentioned that he had a question. So, all right. I was able to get Chuck. Hey, up here. Walter. Chuck. Thank you for being here. Hey, I, just a, another off the subject uh, idea out there. Another one of your personal friends, probably and a personal friend of mine and my family's is the uh, Michael Lewis, it'd be great to have uh, you and another New Orleans author collaborate someday and maybe even make a movie. Well, I tell you, we are doing a lot of things together. Michael is a deep, close, personal friend. We went to Newman together, the high school in New Orleans. I talked to him. When his Sam Bankman Freed comes out in late October, we're going to do quite a few events together. And so why don't, if any of you got a great idea, he probably doesn't know Twitter spaces from a Mardi Gras parade. But I will explain to him that we have to do a Twitter spaces together because part of my book and I gave him because I share my material and he gave me some of his is the unbelievably interesting interplay between Elon and Sam Bankman Freed when Elon is trying to raise the money from Ellison, who went in for a billion dollars. So that might answer a previous question. But um, Sam Bankman Freed keeps wanting a meeting with Elon and. Elon has become allergic to Sam Bankman Freed and won't take a meeting with him. And Michael uh, Grimes, the Morgan Stanley banker, is trying to arrange it. So uh, all of that is in both my book and Michael Lewis's book. And we'll prob we will be down in New Orleans together after his book comes out. Uh, all of you are welcome to New Orleans Book Festival, March 14th through 16th at Tulane, where Michael and I, but many, many other people, are going to be there, but Michael and I are going to do a couple of joint appearances and jointly sign books. He's a great guy, Michael Lewis. Yeah, that's a it's a great family friend, and I've been to Mardi Gras with him and his kids. Uh, obviously, the tragic loss uh, of one of his yeah. loved ones recently. But uh, if you give me a a, a, a follow, I'll, I get some DM ideas for you, Walter. Thank you. Uh, wait, wait. Say say how to reach you again. Hold on. This is I'm I'm Chuck Cook up here on the speaker panel at the moment, and. Um, yeah, yeah and that'd probably be the easiest, just like you just did. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to. I, oh, there's Chuck Cook. Okay, follow back. All right, done. Thank you, sir. The the, the infamous Tesla left turn. Uh, that's that's how I know Chuck. I see it's uh, really nailing it down. Okay, Adam, you got one more here. Yeah, I'd love to talk, Walter. You, know, you probably know Elon better than most people just being in and out of every day with him. So if you could go back and have all this time with him again, if you were rewriting this book, I'm curious, what area, what topic, what question for Elon would you dive in deeper, knowing what you know today, but you'd be excited to dive into it even deeper? Well, in March, when GPT-4 came out, I went back through all my notes because I have notes and everything from these incredibly long meetings and stuff about things that happened in 2000 and you know 16 17 18 with open AI and I suddenly realized I wasn't using the beginning of open AI the Sam Altman thing uh, uh, you know um, uh, Reed Hoffman and some of the others doing it and so I quickly went back to Elon and said, oh, AI is becoming a, you know, a bigger deal. I've got to go through all my notes and our interviews on it. And now you have to explain exactly how you had a falling out with Sam Altman, exactly what your feelings about it are right now. 
And that's when he was just saying, well, you know, it's not announced yet, but I've got to start my own AI company. And so I did the last, the ending of the book. I don't want to end with people wringing their hands about blue checks on Twitter. And so the book ends with a few chapters. One is turning FSD into a pure AI learn from human imitation play. And then that flows in to Optimus that then flows into XAI. So I guess I would have paid more attention three years ago to AI. Omar, I want to actually bring it to you once more. Just maybe take two more questions here. Omar, do you have any other thoughts, questions, or anything along those lines for Walter? Uh, no, not at the moment. Thank you, Omar, for all you do. I'm a fan. Oh, I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you so much. Oh, I love it. Hamid, then let me check with you because I think we might just have Walter for another minute or two. Do you have any other questions that you want to throw out on here? <laughs> just want to thank Walter for um, joining us. I mean, I, I've been such a huge fan. Well, thanks. Well, thanks. I'll be back. Uh, Y'all get sick of me by the time. Uh, but uh, have me back or DM me or, you know, I, I follow these spaces all the time. If I get interested, I'll raise my hand. One, yeah, one more, thank one you more so quick much, question Walter. for you, Walter. Yeah. Um, Elon seems to be, uh, like with, with respect to the vehicles that he makes, uh, performance is an extremely important thing to him. He, uh, as soon as, for example, the Porsche Taycan uh, beat uh, the time in Nuremberg, Germany, he sort of dropped everything, uh, put a team together to build the Model S Plaid that sort of beats the Porsche Taycan's time. And uh, the, the question is, I guess, like, how, how does the importance of performance and speed and racing in particular play into Elon's psyche for Tesla? I don't think it's an obsessive thing. I do believe that when Tesla was launched, he felt that the biggest problem with EVs was the golf cart problem, that people thought they were underpowered, that they wouldn't be able to beat a Porsche. And, of course, he bought the McLaren famously uh, when he cashed out at uh, what that is now PayPal. So, I mean, he cares about performance, but he, he is able with his engineering mind to balance performance, cost, manufacturability, and safety. And I think if you asked him, it's being able to balance four or five factors, not just going for performance at all costs. All right, I'm going to rip sense. off, Th uh, and you. I'll be on some of these in the future, especially when people ask me to be. The book is September 12th, and maybe right around that period, my publicist is Simon & Schuster, is Julia Prosser. She's easy to figure out. If, you want, if somebody wants to host a show or two on the book or a podcast on the book, Feel free to contact her or whatever. Uh, I'll be happy to do, uh, you know, uh, especially when the book's coming out, I'll reveal everything that's in it. Yeah, thanks so much. This has been just an incredible amount of information. We really appreciate you coming by. It was a joy. See you all later, and I'll, I'll hang out while you all keep talking. Okay, perfect. Might do like five, 10 more minutes here. Thank you so much to Walter, but also a big thank you to everybody that's been on this panel. We appreciate people taking time out of their busy days to come and share their thoughts with us. And of course, to everybody that's asking great questions, giving great answers, we couldn't really do it without you. I love playing. And I know that Evan does as well, the host, the moderator, and just intaking all this great information that everybody puts out. Uh, big thank you, of course, to Omar, Ross, Warren, Chuck, Jeff, so many others that are on the panel here. And one big shout out again to Hamid, uh, CEO at Savvy Trader. We have the Savvy Trader account on here. They were the inspiration for this space. I hit up Hamid at the beginning of the space. I was like, do you want to keep this Tesla topic rolling? He's like, let's keep going. I want to dive all the way into this. So big shout out to them. And um, I can just appreciate their mission. I think all Tesla people will probably appreciate their mission too, which is just transparency and investing, right? And showing people what are we passionate about. And I think that a lot of people on this space are very transparent with the way that they invest. And uh, myself and Evan, like I mentioned, we're publicly sharing our portfolios. They're in the top of the space. People can go in. They can see them. They can see the up days, the down days. 
Thankfully, there have been more updates lately, especially if you own Tesla and tech inside of your portfolio. And uh, we encourage you to go and take a look at our portfolios if you haven't. Again, pin the top of the space, comment it underneath. And you can also see Hamid's on there as well, uh, which is doing really, really good. And, and Omar has a shared portfolio on there and so many others. So we love promoting the transparency and tying it in with Tesla and Elon investing. Evan, let me pull back to you for a second, if that's okay. Uh, first off, curious if you had any other things that you wanted to say in regards to the conversation that we've had here, any other things you want to uh, speak to? And then if you had any thoughts, I know you've been uh, checking out the AMD event, if you had any takeaways from that for us. Yeah, the AMD event has been interesting. Uh, I'm going to use the word a little boring for the first part of it, but uh, we'll see how it goes. They're just announcing a lot of partnerships with companies like Facebook, Citadel, Oracle, AWS, and other stuff. They're talking through, now they're talking through AI. AMD CEO Lisa Su, hitting the keywords, she said uh, AI is AMD's largest and most strategic long term growth opportunity. They said that they expect the total addressable market for data center AI to reach $150 billion plus by 2027. It's currently around $30 billion. So they're expecting about a 50% CAGR on that one. Um, so that's a, a pretty quick growth there. I believe NVIDIA, though, I don't know what the year was. They had theirs around $1 trillion. So interesting conversation there going around uh, AMD and AI. And, and yeah, but overall, not the busiest of events. The White House did come out and say, uh, I believe it was the press secretary, that the latest CPI report showed continued progress in lowering inflation. So taking a little bit of a victory lap on the CPI report that we had this morning. Perfect. And Hamid... Um, I'm probably down to do maybe like three, four more minutes. I had a call, but I pushed it back a little bit. Did you have any other comments in regards to not just Tesla, but the market as a whole and things that you've been focusing on in the world of tech or anything else on Savvy? You know, the, the market has been uh, fantastic this year. And of course, um, as expected, CPI just continues to go down. Um, it, the, the, the numbers is an aggregation of a year's worth of data. So when you look at look back a year ago, the month that is getting dropped, which was May of last year, getting dropped, uh, is what causes the huge drops uh, to happen. And then June is going to be another huge drop that's going to happen. And uh, this inflation thing has been relatively under control for the past six months. So I, I was surprised that the Fed was not sort of taking that into account. But now that the numbers are supporting it, is uh, uh, it, it would be hard to imagine the Fed continuing to raise interest rates. So. Uh, I think we're going to see a pretty good rest of the year as well. I think uh, second quarter numbers from um, some of the S&P 500 companies, especially in tech, are going to continue to be strong. Uh, so I'm very optimistic as to what the market is going to do for the remainder of the year. And, uh, you know, my, my investment portfolio, as you already mentioned, is also publicly available on Savvy Trader. You can uh, link to it from my bio Um and you can see exactly what I've invested in. But year to date, I'm up something like 43%. It's kind of crazy. And you can see the performance on a daily basis um, as well on Savvy Trader. So that transparency is all there. Thanks, Wolf, for doing these. Yeah, absolutely. Always a pleasure to be on these, to be able to host, have a chat. JP, you got a comment here? Well, I just realized uh, Walter made some comments, and I think we're all just excited that he was on. Um, but he was like, yeah, we were in the room and figuring out whether the next gen vehicle should be in Mexico or Austin. And I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, has he seen the vehicle? Like, I'm like, we didn't even ask him if he's seen any of the new products because he, he's clearly behind the wall on all this cool stuff that's coming, you know, in both energy and, and autos. And I'm like, he's, I'm wondering like if he had full access to kind of see what this next gen platform looks like, how many vehicles are going to be on it. And like, you know, how excited we really should be uh, for what's coming. Uh, read the book. This is Walter. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, I, I've been at product meetings and Franz is a genius. I love it. But also important is being at the design meetings for the next gen factory and how each station on the assembly line will work. Hey, Walter, on that note, because in, in the jobs book, you comment on like the two obsessions that Elon, I mean, uh, that jo Steve had. One was on the design of the product. And then you mentioned in the book multiple times, the long marketing strategy sessions and hiring the advertising agency. Tesla's hotly debated on whether it should be advertising or not. 
you know, is that something that you've been abreast to conversations about how they think about marketing the product and, and the company? Yeah, uh, uh, Elon doesn't believe in that. He's not like Steve Jobs at all. I mean, I sat there with Steve Jobs as he recited to me each version of Here's to the Crazy Ones and Misfits, the Rebels that he wrote for the, you know, uh, his comeback ad at Apple. Whereas Musk believes if you make a good product, people will follow and you don't need advertising. He obviously has said publicly that, well, maybe they'll consider it. But I've not seen him personally consider or care about advertising, which, by the way, does not make him have a great, perfect feel for Twitter, which is an ad-driven medium. But Linda Yaccarino knows advertising better than anybody. Yeah, did you, brought in the sorry. right compliment his weakness on it as well. Um, by the way, just wanted to let the audience know if you do like Twitter Spaces, we do have a wide number and variety of them. Myself and Stock Market News, you can actually see a full school up on my pinned tweet on my page. So a couple of people have asked me, you know, when the next space is going to be. I post out a full schedule every Sunday. This week we have twenty-two different spaces scheduled. Uh, if you like this Tesla one, you're probably going to really like the one that we're going to do on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. That's going to be an artificial intelligence and a market analysis space. Wow. Probably going to talk some Tesla, some generative AI, some pieces along those lines as well on it. And then we also do every single day a 3 p.m. EST power hour space where we bring on industry professionals. We're going to cover the FOMC market, uh, the FOMC event tomorrow live, uh, a bunch of others like that. So as long as you're following this Wolf account, Stock Market News' account, and some of the other speakers that are up here, You'll see these spaces showing up at the top of your timeline. And, of course, you can always see my schedule. It is pinned to my page, and I repost that every Sunday, and I spend, like, 20 hours uh, over the course of Thursday, Friday, Saturday making that. So any uh, anybody checking it out, we always do appreciate you, and we, we put a lot of effort into these. Um, we can make our way around, unless, JP, you got another comment? Yeah, just while we have Walter, I guess two last things, and then I'll let you go. Has Elon read the Jobs biography that you wrote at all and then reached out to you? And then two, the section when you mentioned like the iTunes store and how Steve went after music and then tried to get newspapers um, and he just couldn't get the New York Times and the Washington Post to agree to that subscription model that, the way that the music industry did. This kind of feels like Elon read that section and is kind of trying to do that with Twitter. Like, so I'm just curious, is there, has he read the, your book of jobs and does he take any of these inspiration of ideas from the people that come before him like Steve? Yeah, he's read the book, but the book he's read two or three times is Ben Franklin. I mean, go figure. And he loves that book and he's always raising things from it. And he liked Einstein as well. I don't think he, I'm not sure he read the Jennifer Doudna book, but he does not refer to Steve jobs that often however the point you make is a good one which is how do you enlist content creators to be able to do content on your site and what jobs believed is that subscriptions are great but they can't be the only thing you also have to have what i call paper drink meaning all right you want this particular uh uh, you know, you want this particular uh, song, you want this poem, you want this podcast, you pay 99 cents for it, as Steve did. And that's what job, that's what Elon is about to do with Twitter, which is to make uh, easy payment systems for, you know, quick payment. You got to get through the Apple toll gate to do it because Apple doesn't allow in-app purchases, as you know. But that's why he was really meeting with Tim Cook. Let me ring off so y'all can do things. Feel free, if you would, uh, to tweet the link to my book uh, that I have, the Amazon link. If you tweet it out, that'll help get the discount down more. Because And as it gets discounted, everybody who buys it gets the lowest price. Perfect. Thank you, Walter. Appreciate it. Definitely recommend everybody take advantage of that discount. I've seen many of you buy in the book throughout this space, and we love to see the appreciation for the speakers that are on the panel. All right. as well as Thank I you. Bye-bye.